That's all you really need. Too, whatever's closest. Uh, Logitech are normally pretty good. You know, as information security professionals, we often do things on the side, we often do weird little hobbies. I mean, how many people here do some sort of historical reenactment or go to a Renaissance fair, mainly to oogle the women? Um, how many people here have a, a, a blacksmithing hobby or woodworking or something they do with their hands? I, I do, I, I, shut up. Um, <laughs> you know, come on, man. Shake weight, yes. How many of you guys have shake weights? Anyway. Uh, <laughs> You know, uh, on the side, I do sort of odd jobs. I, 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 okay, I literally do horse show announcing. I, I do public speaking. You might notice I'm fairly decent at it. And horse show announcing, hey, it pays, and it's a lot of fun, and they feed you really well. Uh, no, New Jersey, <laughs> which is a different country, I know, especially for all you Delawareans. And, and something about lower, slower Delaware, I don't know. Anyway, um, but I, I turned down a, a gig, actually, uh, weirdly enough, DJing for a, an equestrian club to be here today. And I just got a call, yeah, he said he's going to borrow your PA system. It's like, no, I don't have one. Ah, anyway, yeah, I, I, in essence, I'm, I'm massively frustrated, but I'm really happy because I'm here and I get to watch an awesome dude known as the Prez pwn an entire ISP in uh, 10 minutes or less, something like that. So uh, he's actually going to do a live demo on all, no, I'm just kidding. He's not gonna own all of you, just a couple of you. Anybody that pisses him off during his talk, he's gonna write down your MAC addresses. Do, do I need to say more, okay? And remember, again, there's a guy with an uh, American Eagle baseball cap on. If he wanders around and offers to plug anything into your laptop, do not let him, okay? <laughs> Ask him why, it, it's actually kind of fun. So, with no further ado, the press. Yeah, press. Hello. Hello, I'm the Press 98. I'm a one man wolf pack. Come on. There we go, much better. My name's uh, Michael Shear, the Pres 98. Um, I'm gonna talk to you about something, uh, an experience that I had uh, um, in the past year. How many of you heard of Shodan? Search engine? Okay, most of you. Uh, how many of you read uh, the uh, ICS uh, US CERT alert that came out last week about Shodan and SCADA systems? Probably a good number of you. Good, I'm glad that came out. That, all that stuff that came out last week, You've been able to do that for using Shodan for at least a year, but they've just actually said something about it. I've been talking about Shodan for just about a year now, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about a little bit about Shodan itself, and then a little bit about something that I just kind of came across when I was using Shodan, uh, and what I did about it. So my presentation is entitled "How to Pwn an ISP in 10 Minutes or Less Without Really Trying." So um, this is just a little bit about myself, or about what I'm going to talk about. Sh what is Shodan? Talk about some basic operations. Some of the screenshots I have here uh, are a little outdated because the, uh, the, the GUI is being updated a little bit, but uh, that'll be fine. I'm going to talk about Shodan as it relates to pen pen uh, penetration testing. And then the bulk of, of the presentation, I'm going to talk about a, uh, a case study of infrastructure exploitation or owning an ISP. 
Um, and then a little bit about disclosure. Um, and yeah, that's great. And then some conclusions. So this is a little bit about myself. I work for Booz Allen in uh, Maryland. Spent uh, almost nine years in the US Navy as an EA-6B Prowler electronic communications officer. Uh, combat missions over Afghanistan and Iraq. And I spent nine months on the ground in Iraq as a counter IED specialist with the US Army. Um, licensed amateur radio operator. I'm one of the founding members of un Unallocated Space, which is a new hacker space in Central Maryland. All my fingers. And a father of four. I'll talk a little bit about that later because, well, you'll, you'll see. I'm going to ask for your money twice today. Um, not for me, but I just want to, so I'll give you that. This is the first time. Um, unallocated space, new hacker space in Severn, Maryland. Uh, if you didn't know, three of today's speakers, Brian Baskin, who spoke uh, this morning, um, Dave Marcus, who spoke this afternoon, and myself are all members of an allocated space. Um, if you're familiar with Kickstarter, it's a fundraising uh, site on the internet. Um, we're raising funds to uh, build out our space. We've actually already met our goal in less than half the time period, but we're trying to uh, go up there. So if you just go to Kickstarter and uh, just type in on un unallocated space, you'll see that. And next Saturday, we're having our grand opening party. So you should come down, enjoy it. We got 1,600 feet of space. It's pretty awesome. Uh, pretty much any time. It doesn't. <laughs> Somebody will be there. So that's the, that's the, for only the first of the, uh, for the first of the two times that I will ask for your money. Okay, what is Shodan? Shodan is a computer search engine, but it's not like Gog, uh, Google or Yahoo or Bing. Um, those the search engines search for content. They search for uh, data on a web page. You write a blog post and it gets indexed by Google. The content of your blog post is what Google is searching for. Shodan is different because. Um, instead of crawling for the data on your web page, it's actually looking for, it's actually doing a banner grab on the, on the web server or the, on the print server or whatever it's doing. So it's, and it's, so it's indexing that information. It's not indexing the content on the page, it's indexing the, um, the HTTP status code, uh, what software the web server is running, et cetera. So, Instead of finding content on a specific page, we're looking for specific devices, desktops, switches, servers, routers, printers, uh, anything that has specific content in the banner. So to optimize your search results, it's useful to know what come or what your banner looks like. Now, is it true that we can spoof banners? Yes, of course we can. But most people don't do that. Most people don't do that. How many, how many people have actually spoofed banners? Probably a handful of people. Okay, and this is an InfoSec community. The general public does not spoof their banners. They don't even know what that means. They don't know what a banner is. They don't know what, they wouldn't even know, if you showed them a banner and said spoof it, they wouldn't know what to do. Okay, so searching on Shodan is just like I told you how it's not like any other search engine, but the way you use it is sort of like other search engines. You got a text box and you put, you put words into the text box and you enclose them in quotes if you want specific information. You can use Boolean operations to include or exclude certain terms. Um, you can create a Shodan account or you can not create an account, that's up to you. Um, or if you have accounts on other systems like Google, the ones listed all up there, you can use those credentials to create an account. Um, but you're not required to. The only problem with, the only difference between logging in and not logging in is some of the filters will not be available to you if you don't log in. There's a uh, country filter and a net filter that helps narrow down your search results and if you don't log in, those won't be unavailable to you. There's also an export feature that allows you to export results into an XML file and if you don't log in, obviously you won't be able to take advantage of that feature as well. So these aren't all the filters, but these are the common ones. Uh, country filter, so if you want to type in a search term and you only want devices in the United States, country colon US. Whatever the two letter country code is for that country will filter all your results by that country. Very useful if you're looking for devices in a specific country. 
host name uh, filters by specific tests in the host name or domain. So I only want to search for devices in the .edu domain. Okay, we can do that. Uh, net filter filters by IP range or subnet. I only want devices in the 12. Dot, zero dot whatever at and class A. Okay, we can do that too. OS to search for specific operating systems, Linux, Windows, etc. And then we can narrow down by ports. Primarily, the most data in Shodan is port 80, uh, but there is some um, other ports I'll talk about. Okay, so you probably can't see the search up here, um, but the search that I put in was Apache country colon ch. So what's that going to do? That's going to find me all the results in Shodan that have the word Apache in their banner and that are in Switzerland or their IP address is registered as a Switzerland IP address. And you can see that there are 24,000 results up here. Okay, so that's just an example of what we can do. Um, now our search term is just Apache 2.2.3. So we're not confining by any other filters. We just want to find anything that says Apache 2.2.3 in, in, in the thing and we get um, 1.3 million. So there's a few out there. If you don't search by country code, Shodan will give you a nice little box up at the top with the top four countries where those results are. So here we have United States, 300 some thousand, Germany, France, Canada. If you click on those links, that will filter down for you. So it's kind of doing it for you. Also, the search results are such that, I know it's difficult to see, the IP address on the side there is actually linked to that page. So if you clicked on it, you would go to it. Host name filter. Okay, so Apache hostname colon dot nist dot gov. So this will find us all Apache servers in the dot nist dot gov domain. Useful now if we're starting, you can see now, as we, as we want to target a specific organization or a specific domain, we can really start filtering down our results. Uh, this is a good point, this is a good time to point out that uh, Shodan has not scanned the entire internet, but it's scanned large portions of the internet, so, um, and there's new scans being added all the time, so. Um, second box, IAS-5.0, hostname colon dot edu. Find IAS 5.0, Windows 2000 boxes in the EDU domain. So it gives you more examples of, again, if you're looking for more specific devices, um, in relation to that um, alert that came out about the uh, SCADA systems, uh, again, if you know what kind of search terms to look for in a, in a, SCADA, in a SCADA banner, put, put, plug them in there. PLC, how about that? That's pretty simple or any other devices, Siemens devices, other such devices. Net and OS filters, we talked about this briefly. Uh, IP CIDR uh, notation, if you want to filter, if you're looking for just a speci very specific range. And OS filter by operating system. I know I'm kind of going through this quickly. This is not the, this is kind of the background to the talk. So you can filter by port uh, 21, 22, 80. Um, and also there is now some um, HTTPS collection. Again, this is one of those features that requires you to log in. Um, so you can look for all sorts of stuff on there. Um, there's also some features in Shodan that require, that I'm not gonna talk about here that do require you to like purchase credits if you wanna get more data. Um, I'm not going to go into whether or not that's good or bad that you're paying for some, that what someone else has already been doing for. If you want that, that's fine. Um, but that is available to you. You can buy credits for some whatever, I don't know what the price is, to be honest with you. There's also searches. Uh, as a logged in user, you can save your searches and you can look at what other people have been searching for. Um, so you can kind of see what, um, see what other people have been searching for. Um, when I talked to John, who is a, John Matterly, who is the creator of Shodan, initially um, he looked at the searches and he, he kind of gave, uh, he kind of looked and realized that people didn't really know, they were kind of using it just like a regular search engine, so they really didn't know what they were doing. Uh, so that's one of the reasons that I started talking about Shodan because um, he actually developed it as like a business advertising, marketing thing. This was not made for penetration testing, by the way. This is kind of what we've turned it into.
because it's really good. Okay, so now we, we talked a little bit about Shodan in general. Now let's apply it to penetration testing. I think if you've caught on to the stuff that I've talked about, you can see where the, where the attack vectors are coming from. These are kind of rhetorical questions, and on the next slide we'll put them on a sort of white to black spectrum of what you think they're acceptable of. So I'll read these off to you. Is it acceptable under any circumstances to view the configuration of a device over the internet that requires no authentication to view? So we're gonna take a look at a device on the internet and it's not gonna ask us a username and password to see it. Now, I can assure you that the, the, the owner of that device did not intend for us to see it, but is it acceptable just to look at it? What about viewing the configuration of a device using a default username and password? What about viewing the same configuration using a unique username and password that maybe you came across some other way? Or what about changing the configuration of that device? So this is kind of where I put these on the, the, on the black to white spectrum. And again, you may disagree with the exact placement. This is kind of what I think. Viewing a device that requires no authentication, not changing anything, just looking at it. I think that's fairly benign. What about with a default username and password? Well, I think we're getting pretty gray now because even if they didn't change the default username and password, they're clearly trying to keep you out because there's some authentication. A unique username and password, and then changing configuration. I, I think these are fairly obvious that you're crossing the line here. But again, there's no, the whole point of this kind of shading white to black is there is no line. We don't necessarily know where the line is. So at what point have you gone from this is okay to this is not okay? I just found all these screenshots. I won't. <laughs> they fell off a the truck. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so pen using penetration, using Shodan for penetration testing requires some basic knowledge of HTTP status codes. And you know these codes, and I know these codes, but it's very good to look at them again and think about how that applies to what we're doing. Uh, we did talk about how banners often advertise the software they're running, the version they're running. Well, what if we know that a particular version of Apache has a vulnerability? We can go to Shodan, search for that version, and know with pretty good certainty, completely passively, without ever going to that site, that they may be vulnerable to XYZ. Banners can be spoofed, but uh, probably unlikely. So here's the status codes that are important to us. 200 OK, uh, this is a request succeeded, this is very good for us, means we can view the web page. 301 and 302, um, these are moved. Uh, codes, we find generally, uh, I have found generally that when we see these codes, they're typically not very useful for us. So these are codes that we can just um, exclude out. We can do a search and then say minus 301, minus 302, we don't want to see these. Uh, 401, unauthorized, requires authentication. And then 403 is a forbidden. So for whatever reason, we're not, we don't have permission to see the page and we can't, we can't even authenticate to see it. The difference between 401 and 403 is 401 um, it's probably going to ask us for a password, whereas 403 is just no. 200 OK, we can view the page without any authentication. Um, we talked about 301 and 302. 401 unauthorized uh, banners, you'll typically have a www authenticate line in the banner. And what this means to us is typically that if we go to that page, we're going to get a pop-up box request looking for a username and a password. Okay. Doesn't mean we can't get there, but it's, there's some obstacle for us. And then some banners advertise defaults. Type in default password into Shodan and see how many banners say what the default username and password is. Doesn't mean those places are using those devices, or using that username and password, but they could be. Okay, so this is a very brief look at a device um, that I found on Shodan. This was a 200 OK, so it's allowing me to view the page. Uh, this is a web interface for a Cisco 1812W. Device name is up there. And this is the old web interface where if you, cl you click on the number of the level that you want. So, you know, level 15, like administrator, root, whatever. 
So surely if we click on these links, that's when it's going to ask us for the authentication, right? Or not. So no authentication required for level 15. No authentication required for configure commands. And this is great. The, the, Cisco is so great. You don't even need your CCNA to know what the commands do because you can just click on them yourself. <laughs> it, like, okay, if, if, you, if you wanted to see the configuration of a Cisco device and you knew, you, you know, show running config, right, or whatever, if you don't know that, it's, it tells you. Okay, what about execute commands? No, I haven't put any passwords in yet, by the way. Okay, now I know what you're thinking. This is somebody's, somebody set up this device to practice for their CCNA and it's not really on the internet or it's not really doing anything. <sighs> okay, I only did show commands, so I haven't changed anything. On the left, show running config. I didn't show, I post the whole thing. I just kind of posted the front, the beginning of it. It goes on and on. And I did a show CDP neighbors. Does anybody know what Okay, you know what CN country code is, right? China. CNC, anybody know what that stands for? China Netcom, one of the big ISPs in China. VPN Hub One. This is the neighbor of this device, so yeah, it's not somebody's CCNA practice device. Ooh, Cisco 3745, that's the device that's sitting right next door. There's lots of these out there. Okay, so let me get into the bulk of the presentation. Uh, infrastructure exploitation, except that, that title sounds so boring, so this is when I changed it to how to pwn an ISP. So I'm playing with, I was doing, working on presentations and I'm looking for vulnerable devices out there, vulnerable Cisco devices, uh, vulnerable any devices, and it's just to see what's out there. So I came across this device, again, no, um, no passwords, no anything. Cisco uh, 3750, I think this is a switch. 3750B, fiber, R2, whatever. So, of course I'm gonna go right to 15, right? Hold on. Yes. This is um, show IP route, just to see what was on there. Um, Originally, oh, so, okay, so the first time I gave this presentation, um, I blacked out all the IP addresses because I, I was still talking with the people who did this. But since then, everything has supposedly been secured and everything, so. And, la and the only time I've actually given this part of the presentation was at, was at DEF CON at Sky Talks, and there was no recording or anything, so I guess this is, I'm going public now. So this is the IP show IP route, and there's all kinds of stuff on here. VLANs, this is the uh, running config, and I know you can't see this stuff, but this is just to show you that it was all right there. Um, hash it, password hashes, everything, you know, all the good stuff in a config. I found some VLANs of interest. Management, OTC net, which will, when we find out who these who this is, it will become more clear. Uh, building wireless lab network, public backbone. I was like, uh -huh. Hilton Convention Center, Courtyard Marriott Coco, protected backbone or something, MPLS backbone. So, this is where it gets really interesting. This is so you're just looking for something and you just stumble across this and you're like, wow. So here's, this is the Courtyard Mary at Cocoa Beach. I don't know if you stayed there, it looks pretty nice. So you can kind of see where this is going. This is not the hotel, this is not the hotel's network, this is the ISP that services the hotel. <laughs> How about, uh, there's other, I didn't go through all the, um, all the VLANs, but there's a lot more. For example, if you wanted a private residence in Cypress Fairways in Orlando, <laughs> their internet comes from this company too. Here's the Hilton Convention Center in Orlando. Looks nice, big pool. 
I bet they have internet too. <laughs> the villages at Lake Lily. Wow, doesn't that sound cool? Rosen Center Hotel, I mean, yeah. So it quickly became obvious to me by looking through the IP addresses and that this was an ISP in Florida, obviously. And yeah, orlandotelco.net. That's very interesting. So it turns out that the device we're on here, which is, um, this is the CDP neighbors. The Cisco 7606, which is their core router, was also exposed. And the, the 3550A, we're on the 3550B now, was also exposed. And they were all in three consecutive IP addresses open to the internet. What's that? It wasn't, for some reason, that was, the, the, the web interface was not enabled on that one, I don't know. This is, this is, so this is them. This is the Orlando Telephone Company. This is the ISP in question. Believe me, I know. Okay, so we t I, I mentioned in the, so here, here's what was open. Um, 30, two, two Cisco 3750 switches and, and their, six, their, their core 7606 router. VLAN IDs for internal ISP network, hotels, condos, apartments, convention center, et cetera. SNMP servers, so their whole out of, uh, out, um, OOB network and everything, everything. You already saw that we had level 15 access. So while I didn't go any further than this, I think that it is not, it's not unrealistic to say that my title, I mean, I could have owned their ISP. I could have routed any of their traffic to me or to somewhere else and done whatever I wanted with it. I mean, would you agree with that? I mean, it's, that's a pretty fair assessment. Okay, so I don't do software. So let's talk a little bit about disclosure. Because I don't do I don't do disclosure. I'm not a, I don't do bugs. I don't do any of that stuff. So how, what do you do when you find this? You can't exactly like. So you know, there's different types of disclosure. What do you, what do you do? So disclosure is just for bugs, right? Right? What about full disclosure? Full disclosure would be like posting something on the internet and saying you're you're owned. Right? Um, maybe. What about partial disclosure, responsible disclosure, no disclosure? I don't know. This is not a bug. So these, this is what's going through my head. I don't really know what I'm doing. Did you just say you wanted to call me? And you want my address, too. So I, I wrote an email. I, I looked up the net block and, uh, and who is, and I found out the contact information for, you know, they, they always list the technical contact. And, and so I wrote an email to this guy, Josh Foster, who's the network contact. And I, I'll read this to you. Let me go back one. Before, let me caveat this. So you found something that was like this, and you, this is a very important step, which I kind of knew at the time, but you have to think about this. Are you going to email this guy and say, I just pwned your network? Or, I mean, how are you going to do this? So I'll read this to you. You can judge whether or not it was a good idea. Good evening and to who it may concern. I was doing some browsing the other day, and I came across the following IP addresses that appear to allow unauthorized access to some of your company's devices. There's the IP addresses. I found that these IP addresses were listed to your co telephone company. I'm emailing, uh, emailing, mailing you as the co contact listed. Appreciate if you could contact me at this email address, just to confirm that you received the email. Thank you very much. So, I didn't really give him any details, but you know. Uh, so he writes back to me, and he asks if he can call me. Can I call you? You want my phone number? Uh, you want my address? <laughs> You know, you know you're thinking it, I mean. <laughs> Woo! Again, I don't do disclosure. I don't do this. I don't deal with these people. So what, what do you think? Yeah, Admiral Akbar. it's a trap. 
So let's write, let, he wrote back, this is what he said. Michael, we greatly appreciate your honesty in this matter. These switches were new additions to our network and did not have the proper security. We'd like to extend our gratitude and appreciation for your honesty and offer you $500 for your kindness. Please, please contact me below so we can arrange this for you. <laughs> okay, so let's talk a little bit about, let's little, so, okay, here, here's where I'm at. Do I call this guy? Is it worth $500 to you guys? Oh. <sighs> okay, I called him. I did, I did, I called him. And he was mostly, it, to be honest with you, this guy, uh, regardless of the $500 thing, this guy was pretty, um, he was not like, he was, I won't say hacker friendly, but he was, he understood, he understands what's going on. And so I called him and he, he was just curious about how I found the devices. And I didn't really want to go into the whole Shodan thing. Not that it was, you know, malicious or anything, because I certainly wasn't doing anything malicious. Um, but I, he wanted to know how I found it. So I told him quite accurately that I do a lot of research on, on headers and, and status codes and, and because that's a lot of what I was doing at the time. And I said that I really just, it was a, you know, needle in a haystack just happened to come across his, his devices, which was very true. And I didn't necessarily go into the Nmap scans that I ran or anything like that, but <laughs> I guess I'm telling him now. <laughs> but not that I thought that was either, I, honestly, I'll, I'll Nmap anybody. I don't, that's, that's not malicious as far as I'm concerned, but. So I, so I called him back. And again, he just wanted to know um, how did I find it? And I kind of told him that story, which was all true information. And uh, he, he said that he, he was thankful that, that I called him. Um, he responded, I mean, he responded like within 24 hours. He was, it was obvious that he was very concerned about it. Um, and, you know, like I said, I don't, I don't do disclosure. So am I going to turn down the money? I mean, I, I don't know. Um, I said, okay. And he asked for my address. I said, okay. You see him, I'm standing here, so I'm, I was not, I'm, I'm still alive. Um, so I gave him the address and they said that, and he, at the t I, I, they never sent me any of the money, so that was really frustrating. <laughs> to this day, honestly, I've never gotten anything from him. And I think that he, when I finally talked to him, he kind of hedged it, he, he made it sound like he was going to, We'll talk about this and maybe send you the money. I mean, it, really, it wasn't really clear, but I thought I was going to get the money and I didn't, so that was kind of frustrating to me. But I did check it and they did, he did, they did shut off the web interfaces, so they at least did something. Um, you know, did they inform their customers? I'm pretty sure they didn't. I'm pretty sure they didn't send an all Orlando Telco email saying we were pwned. You know, not likely that they did that. Um, but you know, take it for what you will. Again, not your typical disclosure story, but you know, if it's something, you, so you might come across something like this, what do you do? Now, if this device was in, you know, another country, I, do you think I would have called them? Probably not. <laughs> um, and I'm at, that's kind of where my research is taking me now. Is, focus, is, is focusing on, just to give you a little bit of a preview um, for what I'm working on next, is focusing on, um, let, let me say, rogue countries and how you might find devices in rogue countries and, you know, if you wanted to, you know, start your own one-man cyber war. <sighs> if you would, if you wanted to. Okay, conclusions. Okay. I don't have any conclusions up here because I sort of know what I think about the whole thing, but you can certainly, you listened, you spent your, your 45 minutes or 50 minutes here, so you know you can think about what conclusions you can draw from it yourself, and I'll leave some time for questions, um, and I wanna, I'll get to this slide in a second. And I'll, I wanna talk a little bit about something completely unrelated. Um, about a month ago, my, um, 
my 19 year old son was killed in a car accident. Um, his, he was riding a car and the car that he was riding in was hit by a driver who was drinking. Sorry, hold on one second. The car that my son was riding in was hit by a driver who was drinking. We still don't know, you know, if, he, if the guy ran the red light or not. Um, either way, my son was killed. Um, and this is the second time I'm gonna ask, for, ask you for money, and it's not for me. Um, my son was, his first passion was skateboarding. And um, there's a, you, you all, you've all heard of Tony Hawk, his famous skateboarder. Um, Tony Hawk Foundation. Um, provides uh, grants to communities to build public skate parks for uh, low-income communities. And the skate parks around my neighborhood were, were my son's um, home away from home. So if you would consider uh, making a donation in his name, I would appreciate it. You certainly don't have to, and I'm not, I'm not trying to pressure you into it with this emotional thing. But um, I think that would be really cool. Um, I probably should have did this earlier so I could do the questions, but um, anyway, let's get back to the questions. If you have questions about, about the stuff we talked about, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to uh, tur turn the whole uh, thing off, to, um, but if you have questions about Shodan, we've got a little bit of time here. I'd be more than happy to answer them, um, and that's about it. Thank you. Questions? Anybody? Um, I could. I mean, I could try. I don't know how. Okay, I'll see what I can do. If I could make if I could make one statement, if I could make one one moral statement about about what happened to my son, um, I know that a lot of us drink a lot all the time, and uh, yeah, we do, and I do too, and a lot of times we, a lot of times we might drink a beer or two or three, and you know we feel like we're okay to drive. Um, we have a rule at our hacker, we don't have very many rules at our hacker space, but one of them is if you come to our space and, dr and drink, you're either sleeping in, in our hacker space or you're getting a ride with somebody who's, who's sober. Because we're not going to have, that's, I mean, in, um, it, there, there, in some, somewhere in the past, there was this like somewhat, un, un, I don't know where it came from, this cool notion that dr drinking and driving was okay, um, but it's not. I mean, it's totally not cool. Um, especially when you're killing people. In the state of Maryland, uh, this is a very short rant, I'm sorry. In the state of Maryland, if you are driving a vehicle sober and you do something stupid, like say you're, you're spinning out or something and you kill somebody, the maximum is 10 years. But if you kill somebody while you're drunk, the maximum is five years. Why? I mean, it's terrible. So I am, I'm already, I have a meeting set up with my state senator and state legislatures and we're, or state, le state delegates and we're going to get the, the law changed in Maryland, so. Okay. I mean, that's, that's seriously terrible. Like, if you are drunk, you actually, the charges are actually less. Did you leverage that by changing the I don't know which is there. Wildcats is the open one. Okay. You can use the open one, or you can use the Bison's one. This is a bigger one. Okay, that's fine. I'm not doing it. No, I'm good. I'm good. Thanks, man.
Yeah, I'm good. Oh, oh. <laughs> I don't care. Come on. You all know about the fire sheet back door, right? This is why I don't do live demos. Just as a personal preference, I tell you, um, I've done a lot of presentations. I've, a lot of my presentations in the past have been on using Firefox as a pen testing platform. And I re like um, two months ago, I switched to Chrome and have not looked back. <laughs> okay, so I'm not gonna log in, but we'll just do, so this is Shodan here. I guess we can log in. No, we don't want to log in. <laughs> okay. Um. Okay, so you see here, the search I did was just Cisco IOS, and um, you'll see a lot of these. Um, this is a good example. Here, here's a www.authenticate line, and it's a 401. So I can guarantee you, if we click on this IP address, we're gonna get a pop-up box, okay? <laughs> so we don't, we actually don't want the www.authenticate. It turns out that um, there's a line here that's called last modified which the www authenticate and last modified lines are almost 99% mutually exclusive. In other words, if we had the last modified, chances are it doesn't have a, a, a pop-up box. And now, not all of these devices, I'll tell you right off the bat, not all these devices are, are wide open, um, but most of them are, and it turns out that I think the last time I checked, there was maybe 7,000 such devices on the internet. And... <laughs> I won't go through this whole thing, but this will set up, you, this will set up the configuration for the security and device manager. Um, and it's not gonna ask me to log in either. I'm trying to, I'm trying to find one of the, it's not, of course, because of the way it is, it's not gonna, Let's try to open a whole bunch here. Now, let, let's say I don't know the commands. Show. <laughs> Everything. Um, you can also find, um, let's see, let me think about some of these other searches we can do. Um, I found a whole bunch of, um, of, so okay, so I picked on Cisco for a while, so who else to pick on? Okay, Huawei, right? <laughs> Um, and I'm, I'm leery about messing with anybody in China, um, but our good friends in Venezuela love China and they have lots of, of Huawei devices. Um, and I, I'm not gonna show it here, but I found a 250 Huawei IP phones 
um, in Venezuela for like some techno government technology corporation. And um, it turns out that um, their configuration pages required no, they did require authentication, but they were the default, like whatever the Huawei, you know, default is. So I figured Venezuela, what the heck, you know, so I tried it. <laughs> and it worked. <laughs> and there was some, so you could do cool things like change the ringtones or whatever. <laughs> but one of the really cool things that you could do was you could change the, uh, the URL or the IEP address where the phone downloaded its firmware from. So think about what you could do if you had like your own rogue firmware image. That's pretty cool. Um, I found a, I, I believe you could, yeah. I also found, in the closing minutes here, I'll talk about some of the other things I found. I found a webcam. So you've all used Google. Every, about, every six months, there's some article in Google about how, you know, you can use Google to find webcams, and the news, somebody in the news picks it up, and they're like, hey, and we're like, yeah, we've seen this every six months for the past 10 years. So I found this webcam in Japan, I think, and this was one of those that had, like, pan and tilt controls, <laughs> and they worked. <laughs> so um, these ladies were sitting there, and I'm like, trying to get their attention. <laughs> but they just, they, these ladies were so diligently working in their, you know, their Japanese habit or whatever, and they just, they would not, they wouldn't do anything. Um, but, okay, and one last part of the story was, so I was looking at this, I was using Firefox, and um, for, for whatever reason, I was playing around with, uh, there's a Firefox add-on called like IE View or something like that that allows you to view pages using the Internet Explorer engine. And I often do that because, you know, browsers sometimes, you know, look at pages differently. And um, when I viewed the page in IE View, it turned out that there was an additional button, additional control on in, that was viewable in Internet Explorer that was not viewable in for Firefox. That was a configuration page for the camera, which allowed you to take snapshots, you know, security controls, anything. Um, so I have I found all sorts of Cisco devices, wireless access points, routers, switches of all levels, you know, um, and uh, there's lots of SCADA devices out there. Um, couple, couple people will ask this question: Could you do this yourself? Of course you could. I mean, think about it. It's, I mean, you could use Nmap to get scripts if you wanted to, or you could use whatever. Um, but someone's already done it for you, so why would you want to? Um, yeah, so that's it. Any other questions? Any? I'll be up here for questions and for about five minutes, and then as the next speaker's getting set up, I'll, we'll take it out into the hallway if people want to talk more. But thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Actually talking to, uh, now that I've done this, I've actually talked to some cert people that said they can take they can take it anonymously and pass it on to the people so that they're kind of in between.